cloud. There we go. Well, welcome to everybody on this uh, beautiful Tuesday here in October, the uh, Chamber of Commerce weather here in, in Dublin. But uh, we're glad that you're joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Mennonites uh, tonight. Uh, there, as I think you should have read in the book, there's not wasn't a lot to read on these chapters. Uh, but the Mennonite Church is is primarily two different sects: uh, the Amish, uh, who I think we know a lot of, and then of course the Mennonites. So they are all part of the Mennonites, but there's different sects and tracks. You know, just like the Lutheran Church, in which there are many different sects and Methodists. All these tend to have different branches off of the tree. But what I thought I'd do is I, I was trying to look up a hymn that is a Mennonite hymn. And so I was looking around a little bit, and their favorite hymn, according to Mennonites, uh, that they like, is the hymn, When Peace Like a River. <clears throat> Does anybody know this hymn? We're not going to sing it, but I just wanted to talk about it. Um, this is the one that ends, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, do you know, some of you know this hymn? It's a beautiful hymn. I think a lot of traditions share it. Um, if you've ever noticed, the hymn tune on it is Ville du Havre. Okay, if you look down here, you can tell what the hymn tune is. Does anybody know what that is? It's actually the name of a ship. And Ville du Havre was the name of a ship. And basically what had happened is uh, the author of the hill, hymn, who is uh, Horatio Spafford, uh, wrote the hymn. But he had lived in Chicago, and he decided his wife was ill, and she needed to go to some place like the English countryside uh, to relax and to be healthy. So he sent his family ahead on the boat. So I want to want to read you what it says about this hymn. I think it's sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. So on the advice of the family physician, Horatio Spafford planned a European trip for his family, for his wife's health. At the last minute, he had to remain in Chicago, but sent his wife and four daughters ahead as planned on the SS Ville de Havre, okay, I mean from the village of Havre, intended to follow them in a few days. The Ville de Havre, however, was struck by another English ship on November 22nd, 1873, and sank within 12 minutes, taking the lives of all four of his daughters. Mrs. Spafford and the other survivors landed at Cardiff, Wales on December 1st, and Spafford wrote this hymn aboard ship as he sailed to meet her. So he sends his daughters, four daughters, and his wife ahead to England, and they have a shipwreck, and the ship sinks. And it is that from which he wrote this hymn. And so I want to read you uh, the, the text of the hymn. I think most of you know the hymn, but I want to read you this with that in mind. And also think about how this might be an Amish or Mennonite, why this is such a favorite hymn of theirs. So let me let me read this. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, right? He had lost four daughters. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Verse three, he lives, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And in the last verse, Lord, hasten the day when our faith shall be sight right, from the Bible, and see what we believe. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumpet shall sound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. And then, of course, each time it ends with the refrain, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Um, a very profound, I think, text for someone who had lost the majority of his family. Uh, his wife did survive, as I mentioned, but uh, but in the midst of that pain and his lot in life, he still clings to the message of Christ's hopefulness. And I think that's part of what why the Amish love it so much, is they're interested in a simpler life. They're not interested in all the electronic advances that we have, like Zoom meetings and things like that, right? I hope you read that in their churches, they meet often just in homes. 
right? And get to know each other that way. But in the midst of whatever might happen, uh, they believe that Christ is with them in the midst of it. So I just wanted to share that. Um, that's what the Mennonites say is their favorite hymn. So we shall see. Yeah. All right. Um, I, questions about that? Go ahead. I I just looked up the, the ship. The thing that I came up with was mentioned in contact with a guy named Thomas Hammond, who was an industrialist. Um, but it says that most of the lifeboats were actually stuck to the side of the ship because of a coat of new paint that dried and stuck the lifeboats to it. And that's always nice, isn't it? Like maybe it had been better if they let that dry for a day rather than killing all those people. Yeah, before yeah. they put the boats back on. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking that might have been better. Yes, it's too bad. Yeah. So, ugh. okay. So at any rate, uh, we'll take a look at who the Mennonites are. Um, they did originate in Germany, although I do want to point out that they're more, much more influenced by Calvin than they were by Martin Luther. Certainly they spring out of that German Reformation, but it's really Calvin that influences them because you notice they end up in places like Switzerland and Austria, which is where the Calvinists were very active. And so the theology of the Mennonite, even though they started in Germany, I think is much more Swiss Calvinist than it is German Lutheran, uh, as I would understand it. Uh, one of the things that happened in the time of the Reformation is as Martin Luther began to shake the tree of the church and say, we need to change some things up here, um, one of, some of the people wanted to throw out everything. And some people, of course, wanted to get rid of churches and stained glass windows and pipe organs and anything that sort of smacked of Mother Church. One of the groups that were involved with this were often called the Anabaptists. I don't know if you've heard of this church or not. Anna, A-N-A, -A, in Greek means to rebaptize. And so Luther and the other reformers were dead set against this. But these people believed, look, if the church is so corrupt and it was about money and politics and power and had nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we need to start over. And so what they believed was that they were going to rebaptize their members and start again. And so they were called Anabaptists. And for that, many of them were killed and because they were considered heretics, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can, you can read about how a lot of that uh, happened. Uh, thousands died as martyrs, as it says, it says on page 86. Uh, and then eventually, of course, they would come to this country. Uh, we know them primarily as the Amish but also the Mennonites, like uh, the wonderful people who do Dare Dutchman. So I love their food. It's a carbo-rich, wonderful diet uh, that the Mennonites have brought to us. But uh, that's where they grew out of. Uh, they emphasize the Bible, especially in giving uh, in the Bible. One of the things that I've always known about the Mennonite church and that I've worked with when I've gone other places around the world is something called the Mennonite Central Committee. And this is a group that is really very committed in every pocket of the world to serve people. So whenever I've showed up at, at somewhere, whether it's Jerusalem or Spain, I always run into people from the Mennonite Central Committee who are doing the work of spreading the gospel, but also of helping people. I went to their website today and downloaded some of the information about the Mennonite Central Committee but they really are a group that are is very involved around the world in helping people and meeting their needs. And, and, and I'm serious when I say almost anywhere I've, saw, I've, I've gone in the world where there's pain and starvation, the Mennonite Central Community is there. So they're very committed uh, to that part of the gospel. And of course, they got a lot, they get a lot of that by looking at Matthew 5. Uh, we know it as the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular, the Beatitudes. So if we have time today, we're going to take a look at those Beatitudes. So they're known for keeping to themselves a uh, simple living. Uh, different ones have different rules, but they're also known in their service worldwide. It's almost, it's not quite the same, but you know how Mormons are required to do a missionary couple of years and go around and spread the gospel. And you see them in the neighborhoods with their white shirts and pants and da 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 da. It's almost the same kind of thing in the Mennonite community that these young people are required to go worldwide to help wherever their need is. So they're, they're doing a great deal of good work 
uh, throughout the world. <clears throat> okay. Um, I wanted to take a look at the table of comparison, and then we'll uh, see what questions you have, and then we might dive into some of the texts that they believe help to uh, say who they are. So the teachings, okay, uh, if you look in, I'm here on page 88, just to look at the comparisons, they accept the Bible as the guide for faith and life, all right, as we do. Uh, again, we emphasize this revelation part of the Bible, but they accept the Bible. They do not call them sacraments. They call them ordinances. So if you see there on the second thing, they celebrate two ordinances, baptism and communion, to be signs and symbols. All right. We celebrate two sacraments. We believe they're means of grace. And this is one thing I, I don't know if I was talking about it here or in the Wednesday night class, but it's always more than just a symbol. So for Lutherans, what we're doing in baptism and communion is more than just remembering something. We believe something is actually happening. So when we baptize, we believe that that water has been stirred up with God's word and it brings blessing and wholeness and faith and life. When I give you the sacrament, I mean something has happened to that bread and wine it's been infused now with Jesus. So something has actually happened. This wing of the Reformation is, especially as we get further out into the Calvinists, like these people would be, uh, they just simply see that as we're remembering what happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? So at their baptism, while it's important, nothing is really happening. And, and at communion, while they remember it, the bread and wine aren't changing. Do you see how that's a pretty stark difference? They recognize it, but they only see it symbolically, whereas we would see those sacraments as actually God being part of our lives. Okay? Trying to make a strong comparison there, but I hope you're hearing me there. Uh, verse 3, they have a voluntary church membership and no infant baptism. Why? Because they believe in a believer's baptism, right? Because it turns on what you believe rather than what God is doing. The reason baptism and communion are significant for us as Lutherans is we believe that God is in the midst of them. They believe it's a decision you're making to follow Christ. Okay? Just a difference there. Uh, they believe faith means obedience to Christ. We're going to take a look at how that plays out in their theology. Okay, oops, I got something else over on my screen here. Um, they believe in the triune nature of God, same as we do. Um, and this is a big one. They advocate nonviolent peacemaking. As there have been different wars throughout the centuries, especially in America, often it's the Amish and Mennonite who will plead a conscientious objection to going to war. So if you can remember during the 70s, when people were being drafted to Vietnam, et cetera, the Mennonite community and the Amish community were among those who said, no, that's against our baptismal directive that we are to be peacemakers. Where do they get that? The Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? Everybody with me? Okay. So I don't know if, if some of you remember that when people declared conscientious objection. And often, because in fact, it is part of their church, uh, they were granted conscientious objection status as Mennonites or as Amish. Lutherans, I mean, we certainly are called in our baptism to peace. And we believe that Christ teaches us to bring peace, but we do not have conscious objection as part of our policy as a church. So Lutherans could argue that, but they couldn't argue it from the church because that's not in our constitution anywhere. Whereas it is within the polity of the Mennonites and the Amish. Everybody with me here? Okay. All right. Um, type of worship, non-liturgical. So very different from what we do. Uh, the sermon is central, often shared preaching and prayers. Again, these are small groups, sometimes at home, uh, very simple. They might have a meeting house, or depending on the Amish or the Mennonite, but a lot of times it's a small group, and the preaching is more sort of a discussion about the text. Uh, governance, congregations are autonomous, but participate in the Mennonite World Conference and other Mennonite conferences for fellowships. Okay. And you can see the Lutheran response to that, that we're independent, we have congregations, synod, et cetera, okay? Uh, on that score, 
questions or comments of anything we've said so far? Do any of you have Mennonite neighbors? You do? Okay, Mary, go ahead. Um, Mary? It seems like the, they have to contact Christ. If, if that if that means what right, I right right they have to participate in the act right yes yes instead of accepting grace right and from right. grace sort of a different to work right. kind of thing right um, yes it gets a little works proud <laughs> right the the problem is is we get out here in 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 Calvinism and we get way out here in Calvinism yeah. He believed in predestination. That was one of the things you, if you read his institute, Calvin's institute, what that means is he believes that the world is playing out as God has predestined it. So we are simply actors in this play that has already been decided. So do you see how for them, okay, they say yes, that they want to be a follower of Christ, but that was already predetermined, right? Okay. Are you with me? Yeah. So well, even though they say yes, it's not that big of a deal because Calvin will author, well, that's because God knew you would say yes at some point. Yeah. And so there's a sort of a determination about life that Lutherans don't share. We believe there's choice, good, bad, evil, all of that. When hard pressed, some people also say that Calvin and that wing of the Christian church believes in double predestination. Do people know what that means? Have you heard that term? So single predestination, Sharon's shaking her head, yes. Single, just regular predestination means that the world's playing out as God has chosen to play out. And we're sort of actors in this big drama that is the world. Double predestination means not only are those that God has chosen to save, but the double part of it is God has also chosen those that are to be, to be damned. That's the double predestination. Those are some who are saved, predestined by God, and there are those who are damned. All right. And the church community would say, as we live in this world, we can see who is saved and who is, is damned. You see how this can be dangerous? Well, like, yes. And dare I say judgmental? <laughs> you know little, what I mean? Is it possible for us to change? You know, what I mean, I I believe God loves everyone and is is trying to save everyone. Bingo. And it's still possible. But there, the, if if everything is already predetermined, there's a certain. And you find out that you are predetermined not to be saved. Why live? Why not live, live up and do all the sinful things? Well, that's what some people would say. Yes. Yeah. So it it becomes it becomes a little bit of a difficulty. Now, sometimes when pressed on this, Calvin said, well, that's not really quite what I mean. But if you actually read his writings, it seems to be that's what he means, meant by it. Well, again, I admire churches... what they do. But um, that? I admire yeah, what they do in the world. And um, it's not harmful, but it sort of is selfish. I don't know. Yeah, it's a it's a. It's a community that believes the world is evil and the world is full of sin and darkness. So the, the way we can protect ourselves is we withdraw by ourselves and we listen to our own ways and we don't submit to the world. So, I mean, just think about this for a second. What is one way that we all know what's going on in the world? It's by radio and TV and media, et cetera. If you close yourself off from all of that, your world is much smaller. And some would say controllable, although <laughs> we all know that that's a farce. But do you understand what's happening? If we can shield ourselves, we can have communities in which God is in control of our lives. We teach those morals, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, the truth is no community is pure. And there is a good deal of in incest within the Amish community, as we all know. And it has caused massive birth defects among both the Mennonite and the Amish community because they've been inbred and there's incest going on. Are you with me? 
I'm not yes. making this up. Slow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. You know that this has happened and it, it's a problem. And yes, when you secret yourself up on the, up from away from the world, it also can exacerbate the problems that might be there where the world might hold those things in check and balance. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the world can help us to say, hey, that's wrong. A justice system can help us. Most first order Amish don't want anything to do with the criminal justice system. We'll take care of it here. You, are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right. They see that as a polluting influence. But it's also possible that a justice system could bring some balance when there is some ingrown problems. And by the way, it doesn't mean this happens in every Amish community, et cetera, et cetera, but it has been a problem within Amish communities. Because when you pull yourself away, and you become that sect, mm -hmm. it, it becomes difficult because the leaders are no longer balanced. There's things that, that provide checks and balances that are no longer there. And so it can be a dangerous community. If the community is run by loving moral, competent people, it could be a very good community. But even moral, competent, good-natured people, Lutherans would say, can be sinful. So what does that leave us with? All right? So that's been part of the problem in these communities. Okay. Uh, rest Others of you, have you had many experiences with the Amish or Mennonite? Or are you just like their noodles like I do? And Yes? Yeah. Sharon? <laughs> The street I live on here in Plain City, um, <clears throat> I think there are three or four Mennonite families. In fact, my neighbor to the north of me is Mennonite, and I find it quite peaceful. <laughs> I really like mm -hmm. I like the yeah. laid back way of this town. It's it's a uh, it is the people are rather isolated. But doesn't the Bible say be in the world, but not of the world? And I think that's where sure. they get it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it does say all those things. Yes, absolutely. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is there is it's it's possible that it'd be really good. Right. It, it is possible. But it can also be dangerous because some of those checks and balances may not be there that would occur in larger communities. That's true of both of both sides. When when you look at people both that are sides. connected to the news, uh, being connected to daily news, I cannot handle that. And my at my age, I can't handle it. So I have to read the news. I, I read it online instead of listening mm -hmm. to it on on TV or whatever. But uh, yeah. yeah, there's benefits both ways. My wife hates this time of year with the political ads, and I mean loathes them. She just wants to, anytime the, 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 the commercials come out, she just wants to mute the TV. And if I say anything about it, she just says, I'm done with it. I can't stand it anymore. Another stupid ad, which I understand, you know what I mean? But she just has an, an allergy. She just gets sick. And it is, it's, it's a long season of one ad says one thing, one ad says, you know what I mean? It's back and forth. I don't think there's anybody who isn't a little bit weary of it by the time this election will be held. Is she expecting that yeah. What's that? I, mean, I just don't watch TV. Yeah. Ken? Uh, do, does she correct her grammar when she's doing this? Grammar for the ads. Does she correct their grammar when she's complaining about the ads? Sharon. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, well. Sharon, the editor, does she correct their grammar? Have you, have you met my wife? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get little notes after the sermon sometimes when I've said something that's not grammatically correct. So, yeah, I think that she does that. That's her. My wife. last boss was so, Mennonite. Yeah. What's that? My last boss was a Mennonite. I found out when I made some crack about you know, I mean, drag, running drag races into boogies. Less boss was a Mennonite? Yeah, his last boss was a Mennonite. Oh. She found out when he was complaining about them running drag races in their buggies. Oh, yeah. You didn't think that was too funny, huh? Yeah, well, that happened. So, <laughs> anybody else just want to chime in on their experience with the? I mean, I I also think they have some beautiful traditions. I mean, who among us doesn't like their 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 food traditions and their and their woodworking and their quilting? Their quilting. I think <laughs> too many of you here have been up to Amish country. 
you know, in, in Northeast Ohio, there's some beautiful oh, things about yeah. it. Yeah, Holmes County, once a year. Yeah, exactly. Whether I need yeah. it or not. <laughs> Whether you need it or not. Okay, anything else or any questions you have? Because I want to look, where do they get some of this from? So I want to take a look at some Bible passages tonight. Because there's not a lot here in the book. But did anybody else have anything else that they want to comment on? One one other so, thing, you know, I... I I read in the book, it said that there's quite a few black Mennonite churches, and I was curious about that, so I did some research on that, and Good. the the black churches in Africa sort of follow the Mennonite traditions, but there are black churches in America that are quite different from, from the Mennonites, but they call themselves Mennonite blacks or black right. Mennonites. Yeah, it's quite interesting yeah. to see some of their sites. <laughs> huh. And I'm really, I'm not familiar with any of them at all. All the Mennonites that I knew by growing up in Ohio, and I went to school in Philadelphia near Lancaster, PA, they were all, they're all sort of German Mennonites, uh, the Amish, you know what I mean? So I'm not familiar with black Mennonites at all. So, okay. All right, well, let's take a look here at this, what they sort of see as their premier text. And that, that would be the Gospel of Matthew. So if you want to pull out your Bibles, I'll give you a second to find one. Maybe you have it on an app or you have one there close by. All right, you biblical scholars. Uh, we all know... Okay that the Gospel of Matthew is the most Jewish gospel by far. And in the Gospel of Matthew, if you just want to think about this way, Jesus is sort of the second Moses. Are you with me? So Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is going to give us the new law. So for those Matthewites, I will call them, because Christianity is obviously a homogenization of all four Gospels, but if we only had the Gospel of Matthew, we see Jesus as a miniature Moses, all right? Where did, did Moses give the Ten Commandments? From Mount Sinai. He handed down the law from the mountain. Where does Jesus give the new law? On the Sermon on the Mount. Do you see the connection here? Matthew, Jewish, Jesus is the new Moses, the new lawgiver. That's very different than in the other Gospels, all right? In the Gospel of John, who is Jesus? He's not the lawgiver. He's the Lamb of God who is sacrificed. When we meet Jesus in the Gospel of John, we meet him through John the Baptist, who points his finger and says, there is the Lamb of God, okay, the one who will die for us. That's the metaphor for the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's about Jesus being a little Moses. So the disciples are like the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob. Are you with me? No accident, there's 12 and 12. Interesting, don't you think? And now Jesus is giving it the law. He's bringing down the law from the mountain. When Luke records these same stories in Jesus, he does not have Jesus coming down a mountain. It's called the Sermon on the Plain. All right? Because Luke is reaching out to Gentiles. So if you think in Gentile worship, they had what was called in those days a meeting place. We know the word agora. Do some people know that? All right. Or if you even think if you've been to Athens and you have this sort of forum in Athens where people speak to one another, they're on the same level, right? I mean, I know that the Acropolis is high up, but when you get up there, people had communication me to you. All right, not top down. All right, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has a sermon on the plain. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's from the mountain. Okay, so we see here, chapter five, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, just like Moses did. All right, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think of that from an Amish perspective, right? Plain, simplicity, right? 
poor in spirit, maybe not flashy, right? Calm down. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. Verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How did the Amish and Mennonites get their start? By lots of people being martyred. Their friends, their families. People were being killed because they were Anabaptists. Blessed are those who mourn. Do you understand how this fits with their theology? Okay. Number five. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. How do you think of the meek? Right? Not as bold and brash but maybe somebody who wears black and has a beard and has a buggy. You know what I mean? There's, there's a simplicity <laughs> and meekness about that life. Yeah. If you're going, you're trying to find the skyscrapers in Holmes County, you're not going to find them, right? Simplicity, farm, community. All right. Blessed are the me. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness meaning not the world, but God's righteousness. Okay. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are, number nine, verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Do you hear sort of Mennoniteism in this? Do you hear it? Okay. That's why it was so important to them. <clears throat> Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's no accident that they got their start by everybody they knew being rounded up and killed. To them, that was proof that the kingdom of heaven was theirs. You with me? Okay. And just a little Matthew thing here, just so you notice. Um, Matthew is a Jew. He's writing to convert Jews. You notice that Matthew never says kingdom of God. Because to say God's name would be blasphemy. So you always know it's Matthew when you hear kingdom of heaven. Because he's not going to say God. That would be an offense to the Jewish people he's writing to. You with me? All right. Verse 11. Blessed are you, Mennonites, when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets before you. Okay. Are you hearing all this in there? I mean, it, it's almost like a, a, what I want to say, a constitution for being a Mennonite or an Amish are contained within these Beatitudes. Okay. But it goes on. This is a long sermon, by the way, which is why Jesus is sitting down. If you will notice that I've advocated this for preaching myself. I'd like to sit down. And preach would be a lot a lot easier but he goes on to, to give some of these sayings you are the salt of the earth okay when you think of somebody salt of the earth what are you thinking of a farmer right someone who does simple things yes all of that all right verse 14 you are the light of the world right what you're doing is important all right um verse 17 this is so matthew verse 17 do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill them. And how Matthean does that sound? And if you also look in the next verse 19, verse 20, you see kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. All right. Again, he was a Jew and was reaching out to Jews. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit uh, in the gospel. But uh, look at chapter six now. Uh, the the the, the um, Sermon on the Mount goes from chapter five to chapter seven. Those three big chapters in in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, chapter six: Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward for your Father in heaven. Right? Think of the Amish here. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue or the streets. Or as the Roman Catholics do in their great big cathedrals, so they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, because your alms may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. All right? Whenever you pray, do not be like the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans who love to stand and pray in the synagogue on the street corners. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your father who is in secret, 
and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay? When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because there are many words. Do not be like them. Your father knows what you need before you pray. Pray like this. And then the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts here in Matthew, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay? You hear the law. These are laws. This is not by grace you have been saved through faith. This is what this is what you need to do. All right? That's very Calvin. It's very Mennonite. Right? There's rules that you have. You're to follow them. Okay? That's going on in here. Look at verse 19 and think of the Amish. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Have you ever seen a gold buggy going down the road? I don't think so. Maybe they have a really good lacquer job on it sometimes, but no gold, right? Simple, simple dress, simple clothes, right? They Some of you know, may know land, another. Though. They have lots of land, that? many, many acres. <laughs> yep, they do. Yeah. But they farm it all themselves with horses and not machinery, right? Yeah. When you go up to Holden's County in the fall, you can always see they've tied together their wheat bundles and their corn bundles, right? Because they they're doing it without machinery. They're not bringing a combine in there, right? Or combine. They're they're doing it by hand. You know, a lot of work. That's also why they tend to have big families as well. Because when you have a big farm and you're farming it, guess what you need? Kids <laughs> to help. Mm -hmm. Laborers for the vineyard, as it were. All right? So verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break it and steal. For you're where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I mean, all these things, it's almost like the, the, the Amish national anthem here in all these kinds of things. These are the things you're to do in order to be right before you God and steal yourself. Don't be braggadocious. Keep to yourself. Have your treasure with God. Don't buy the Tesla, right? Keep to the buggy. You with me? Okay simplicity all right do some of you know it, it's a shaker song but the amish use it too tis a gift to be simple tis a gift to be simple tis a gift to be free da, da, dun, 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 da, 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 da. but that that always reminds me of this community just their their simplicity in things um very plain and real down to earth not exotic right I, I've traveled all over the world, and other than the ones in the Mennonite Central Committee, I do not see Amish out there. Do you? Have you ever seen Amish outside of Ohio and Pennsylvania? Not many, right? Mm -hmm. Mennonites, yes, but not so much the Amish. Questions or comments? I found a, a service online, uh, the Beachy, Beachy Mennonite Church, not far from me here. It was a funeral service, and, and I thought, well, I'll watch that and see what I can find out. But one of the things they do is there's no organ or piano or anything. They have the, well, I forget what that little tuner's called where you blow the notes to yeah. get your starting pitch note. Pipe. Yeah. Pitch pipe. Well, sometimes it's a harmonica it. or a mouth it. harp or just a tuner. Pitch board. pipe. Yeah. yeah, pitch pipe. So yeah, a guy gets go. up and he gives the pitch. And then he just starts directing, and the entire church starts singing in four-part harmony. Oh, wow. I know. It's I know. really beautiful. It's amazing. It is beautiful, absolutely. And and without, it's a cappella, right? It's not with any instrumentation. Yeah. You know, it is beautiful. Do you find, I, I was interested in what Sharon was saying, that there's some parts of the community that I think I find some interest in. I mean, I'm a gardener, I'm a beekeeper, I like to do some of the things, but there's also things in the community that seem, I'm trying to struggle for the word and not for it to sound pejorative, but for lack of a better word, I'll just say it, they seem a little backward though. Do you know what I mean by that? Like with healthcare, with modern conveniences, da-da-da-da-da. They also, rustic. by the way, 
rustic, but they're also fairly um, paternalistic and patriarchal. You know what I mean? Yeah. The women do not have to say. The man has to say because that's what the Bible says. You're saying there's not a there's not an equal status in the Amish community. The men are in charge. The women are home making food for the men. You with me? So yeah. while there's parts of the simplicity that I sort of think, ooh, that'd be nice. There's parts of it I'm not sure about. Other other thoughts anyone has? Same here. It's nice to go to Holmes County to depress, uh, to um, get away from all the hubbub that I have in my life, but I wouldn't want to live there. Yeah. I would, uh, I would like to be Amish myself. <laughs> would you really? <laughs> I could get into that. I, could, I really could, except I don't like to cook so much. <laughs> I wouldn't like the role of the woman. but um, Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the women's position might bother you a bit, Mother Nail. Yeah, yeah, just a little. <laughs> I know it works, though. It works, that whole, that whole situation. But you have to buy into yeah. it. But, about health care, you know, you said they keep to themselves, but they take care of themselves. So they don't have mm -hmm. Medicare and they don't have any private plan of insurance. But if somebody gets sick, everybody in the church they, is pitching in and helping out. And that's the way our yep. churches should be, I think. Yeah, they, they gather around them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. They also don't have nursing homes. They care for the elderly. Yes, it's absolutely true. Yeah. So it's sort of like, I guess there's some really good things I want to glean and then other things that I don't know. I'm not sure I can give up college football on, on Saturday. I don't know. It might be, it might be hard. I'm just, just being honest. Uh, Neither could to me, that's sort of a, I think we all do. You, don't we all have our things where you're just, they're sort of like mind direct, mindless. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes sports can be like this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You just, it takes you away and you're rooting for the game and, you can just forget everything else for, for for a minute or two. You know what I mean? Not for your whole life, but it sort of sweeps you away. I think that's why it's so popular, don't you? It sort of just, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, whether the Buckeyes win or lose, it really doesn't matter in the course of human affairs. That's interesting. Oh, and I, I know people who would disagree with that. Yeah. But, what's that? I know people I mean, who would disagree with that. Yeah, well, yes. I know. I, I hate it during stewardship season when we're trying to have a big Sunday and the Buckeyes lose the night before because <laughs> everybody's on Depressville. So, <laughs> but, but it's also like, but, but we can also have with games and things like that. We can be energizing. It'd be fun. But then when it's over, it's over. And I always think, isn't the other team trying to? Don't they want to win? I think so. <laughs> Pretty yeah. sure. Pretty sure the other team wants to win too. Yep. But we get stuck in that. And of course, the Amish do none of that. They don't have TVs. They don't follow that stuff at all. And first of all, I have too much work to do on the farms. Ah. They have no modern conveniences that way. Mm -hmm. you know. Do you feel like you know more Mennonites or do you know more Amish? I'm trying to get to know the Amish. Yeah. Do you know the Amish better? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think more. I've ever... I don't think I've ever met either one, but I know more about the Amish. The Amish? Yeah, but like Dare Dutchman, that's Mennonite, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is, actually. I don't know. Dare Dutchman is Mennonite, right? Sharon, you live out that way. Mm -hmm. I don't eat Amish. Over. Unfortunately, I don't eat over there very often, but I think they are. But, oh, come but on. There's, there's old order Mennonite and old order Amish, and, and they're so mixed up that the people that live next to me yep. are Mennonite, but they have TV and uh, I don't know if they watch sports, but they have cars. And so it, it's it's a whole spectrum of different yeah. traditions and such. Yeah. And I guess they just choose family by family, which ones they're going to honor and which ones they won't honor. Right. Lutherans are the same way. We're on a whole big, long spectrum. The really conservative Lutherans and the real liberal are on the other end. I, I think and I think that's one one thing we're going to find is we just is we as we explore these different faith traditions, almost every faith faith tradition has people all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. But it's sort of the central things that they value that hold them together. 
-hmm. But the truth is, in our congregation and all, we have conservative, we have liberal, we have everything along the spectrum, just like everywhere else. And in the denominations, you have about all over the place. It's just the way people are. Yep. And it's no different in the Amish or the Mennonites that it is among Lutherans. Yep. Ken, do you have a question? Okay. Look at, uh, as long as we're staying here in the Sermon on the Mount, look at chapter 7 now. <laughs> How's it start? Do not judge, <laughs> lest you be judged. Hmm. Interesting, huh? For the judgment you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. <clears throat> Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but then it's the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will be clear to take the speck out of your neighbor's eyes. Okay? Verse 7, skipping ahead here, ask, it will be given you not. Right? Okay? Seek things in your life. Verse 12. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. What would we normally call that passage? Golden rule. Golden, Golden rule. rule, right. Or this is the law and the prophets. Do you, do you hear this from Matthew? Or maybe a better way to say it is this is the new law and the prophets that are come from Jesus. Because what was the old law? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Now here we have do unto others as you would have them to, but also forgiveness was important in this, right? Enter through the narrow gate, okay? Beware of false prophets. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right there, you know it's Matthew. Okay. And then this, verse, I wanted to sort of uh, close up a little bit with this idea. Look at chapter 24 as we end up um, these, these sayings. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, all right? Being a Christian, according to the Amish, is to hear the words of the new Moses and Jesus and to act on them. And if you do that, verse 24, you will be like a wise woman who built her house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words and does not act on them, okay, see, so it's about acting. It will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. And then this, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them, think Moses here, as one having authority and not as their scribes, right? Who is Jesus, according to the book of Matthew? He is the one who's going to give the new law. He's going to call disciples. And if we only have the gospel of Matthew, then the deal is you follow what Jesus said. All right? The problem is I have with that is that doesn't quite get us to grace yet. Right? At this part, all we're doing is doing something. Right? Here's mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do. Please do it. All right? The gospel of the Lord. That doesn't yet get us to God's grace in our lives, which I think some of the other Gospels do a little better. There's much to learn in Matthew. I'm not just trying to throw him in the wall, but to understand this law portion. And, of course, they cling to this. All right? One other passage. Does anybody have any questions on that? So the, they take big from the Sermon on the Mount. And then look at 1 Corinthians 12. Because this is also important in the Mennonite culture. So that sixth book of the New Testament, seventh book of the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 12. <laughs> Spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. May I find it? Got it. Okay. Go ahead. 
Pete, read a little bit about these spiritual gifts. You know where it is, don't you? Go ahead. Yeah, you want to start at the beginning of the chapter? Sure. Okay. It says, well, actually, concerning... I, a little bit. I would skip down a little bit because this has more about the spiritual nature and all that stuff. Start at verse, um, let's see. Four. Three. Well, okay. Looks like four is where it gets into the. Yes, there you go. The nitty gritty of it. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. Why don't you finish with 12 and 13, then we'll talk. Okay. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Okay. So do you see how this also could be a model for community? Here we have this community, and in this community, People have different gifts. Some can do this, some can do that, da 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 da. All of these gifts, they would argue, are given by God. That's what St. Paul is saying. All right. And they're all for the building up of community. Or if you want to think about it, it's family, right? In this family we call the church, people have different gifts. That's a good thing. And he uses this analogy of the body. All right. And then here in verse 14, he gets a little bit funny, I think, although I never hear people laughing when we read this in church. In the BD, the body, verse 14, does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it less any part of the body. If the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, this is Cyclops theology, by the way, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. All right? And again, they believe in this natural revelation of God. God has given us what we need. We don't need all that stuff in the world, right? God has given us a body here with different gifts. And as we concentrate on that body, we can be the church. Okay, a lot of theology from these passages. Questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, I've I've noticed on occasion um, if there are kids who actually pay attention to this when it's being read, they will start whispering to their brothers and sisters about which part of the body they are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, right. in the fallacy of it, uh, Rudyard Kipling, I think it was, the blind men and the elephant. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Because if you try to describe the elephant and you have to do it with your hands instead of your eyes, you come up with some pretty funny things. <laughs> Interesting things, yes. <laughs> exactly, yes. So, All right. Well, we've explored some of the Mennonites and Amish tonight. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to explore the Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> Any former Presbyterians here? My wife was. That's where I met her. Mm -hmm. So I actually worked in a Presbyterian Church, <coughs> excuse me, for a couple of years. So I know, know more about Presbyterians than other denominations. So, all right. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. And and talk about the these reformation churches all right blessings to everyone thank you thank you you're welcome <clears throat>